Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as we do apologize for the technical difficulties on our end, and we greatly appreciate your flexibility. Today, we will learn from Dr. Gina Sarioko, board certified in internal medicine and integrative medicine. She's a provider with Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Dr. Sarioko will be discussing science-based integrative medicine strategies for lifestyle and supplement approaches that cultivate resilience against viral illness. We would like to remind everyone to feel free to post questions in the chat box throughout the webinar. Your questions will be seen by the moderator and asked at the end of the presentation. If you have questions similar to those that have already been broadcasted in the Q&A box, you can like the question by clicking on the heart icon next to it. We'd also like to hear your feedback on today's event. Please take the survey after the presentation by clicking on the link that will be posted in the Q&A box. And now we welcome Dr. Sarioko for her presentation. And thank you all. Thank you for joining me today. So as this pandemic unfolded, I felt deeply that there was more that we could do to shift the global odds of survival. I mean, the mere fact that over 80% of the population recovers after minimal symptoms means that we possess the machinery within us to fight this infection naturally. So while pharma companies are searching for the drug that will keep the hospitalized from dying, I'd like to talk to you about staying out of the hospital in the first place. So I had a lot of fun researching for this talk and I'd like to share with it uh, you with it today. Let's see here. Uh, can I get my slides to advance? Slides aren't advancing. Skype was having a little bit of issues today, so I apologize. Let's see if I can manually advance this. Okay, we'll do it this way. All right. So first, we got to get this pandemic a little bit more under control, doing it together. So sunshine and de-escalation does not mean loosening up on the basics. So basics, soap and lather for a full 20 seconds. The soap is what kills the virus. And then rinse, do this frequently. Our cloth masks protect each other. Studies suggest that you're most contagious within the two days prior to symptoms. So wear your mask, even if you feel well. It's actually the healthy people who are infecting those with the highest risk of dying. Social distancing, the suggestion is six feet, but let me clarify, it's six feet with a mask, okay? So if for some reason you're out in public without a mask, the safer distance is more like three times that, closer to 20 feet. And exposure risk is also directly linked to the amount of time you're in close proximity to someone. So piling into a car with your masks on and carpooling to the beach is actually not recommended right now. Um, and generally being outside is safer than being inside with a mask. Okay, so let's all participate together. Now, what if despite best efforts, your body comes into contact with the virus? So what happens, and we're gonna take a look at the science and I'm a keep it simple kind of gal, okay? So first the virus attaches to human. So pretend this is the virus. The virus has these spike glycoproteins and it's like a key and it's looking for this thing called the ACE2 receptor on the cell, usually a nasal cell, and this is like the lock. So as soon as the key hits the lock, it allows the door to open and then the virus gets into the body, all right? Now, next, once it's in the body, the virus hijacks the human machinery to start to replicate, and then it spreads. So replication uses something called protease enzymes. So we're going to want to look for ways to block replication, block, it, block attachment, block repli replication. And there seems to be some natural ways to do this, so we'll look at that in a moment. And then what happens when the virus is in the body, right? Human reacts to the virus, danger, danger. We need to defend ourselves. So there's a lot of things that happen cellularly, but today we're gonna focus on the NLRP3 inflammasome. This is a protein complex in each cell that when it's activated, it plays a role in cytokine production. Now cytokines are signaling molecules of the immune system that mediate inflammation. This is like our defensive fire. So activating the NLRP3 is like striking a match. 
sometimes a controlled fire can be beneficial, but if that fire gets out of hand, a cytokine storm, which causes more damage than good can happen. And that's what we see in a lot of high, uh, hospitalized patients. So to optimize our immune reaction, we wanna decrease cytokine production by dampening this NLRP3 inflammasome. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. But why? do some people seem so much more susceptible to this infection, to this cytokine storm than others? Why do certain people, like those with heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and to a milder extent, asthma, why do they have a higher risk of hospitalization? The answer seems to be baseline inflammation. Okay, these disease processes are often associated with elevated baseline cytokines. So if you normally have a low level, but then you have a disease process that has elevated cytokines, and then the virus stimulates even more cytokines on top of the existing ones, we're more likely to get into trouble. So the good news is that you're able to decrease your baseline inflammation no matter what level of health you're starting with, no matter how many medications you're on. So that's what we're going to focus our attention on today. Let's rise above the disease labels. So then what are our medicinal goals, right? We want a medicine that does these four things. It blocks attachment of the spike glycoprotein to the ACE2 receptor. It blocks replication via these protease enzymes. It modulates or decreases this NLRP3 inflammasome, and we decrease inflammation, thereby improving also immune function. So I'm guessing that people would pay a lot of money for a drug that did all of this, but what if it's already in you and around you? So this is what we're gonna talk about today, always starting with, of course, nutrition. So if you remember nothing else from today, this is the rule I want you to remember at the store. If it looks like it came directly from a garden or a farm, it's probably good for you. But let's get a lot more specific. Vitamin P, I bet you haven't heard of vitamin P. So scientists in the early 1900s were looking for that magic substance and colorful plants that was so important to health. And now we've come to know that there are actually over 6,000 of these substances called bioflavonoids. These are plant compounds that are powerful antioxidants that neutralize stress, inflammation, and damage in the body. So I wanted you to just take a mental snapshot of just a few of the most powerful bioflavonoids and herbs for this pandemic. There's ECGC, epigallocatechin gallate, uh, which is found in green tea, quercetin, which is found mostly in radicho, colorful peppers, onions, etc., hesperidin from citrus, curcumin, You'll see why we highlighted these ones in a second, because this is a talk about targeted nutrition. So you might ask, how do we know that these specific foods are so helpful? I'm glad you asked. So the whole world is scrambling right now to find medications to fight COVID-19, and one strategy being used is called a molecular docking study. So you remember how glyc uh, those spike glycoproteins fit into the ACE2 receptor to gain entry into the cell, like a key into a lock, and also how we need those protease enzymes that function kind of similarly. So we want to block these interactions. So if we have surfaces that are like the lock and we can find something else, so instead of the virus, something else that fits into that receptor, thereby the virus can't get in, okay? So this is the principle behind the molecular docking study. So scientists are, used, are able to look through huge databases for other molecules that match these same surfaces. And then they use the ones with the tightest match to move forward in clinical trials. So that's how hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir, these two prescription drugs you may have heard on the news, that's how they were discovered as possible remedies. Most of these base databases used are with old prescription drugs, hoping to repurpose them during the pandemic. And you know, unfortunately, sometimes prescription drugs can have quite severe side effects, as has re recently been discovered for hydro hydroxychloroquine. Um, so plant-based solutions seem like a better idea, right? So it turns out that we have a huge database of molecules from plants. And when you run the same kind of tests using the same machines, 
we find a lot of matches. So I'm going to show you some hot off the press research. Um, and these are the conclusions from the research studies. This is a preprint study from Italy. Hesperidin, a bioactive flavonoid abundant in citrus peel, stands out for its high binding affinity to the main cellular receptors of the SARS coronavirus 2, which causes COVID-19, outperforming drugs already recommended for clinical trials. So hesperidin seems to be able to block attachment and replication and thereby possibly decrease inflammation just with citrus and a lot of hesperidin is found in the peel so don't ignore the peel what about this study it's a preprint out of algeria our results demonstrate that quercetin and curcuma have a better binding affinity to the main covid protease and the ace2 receptor better than hydroxychloroquine interesting so these natural agents are able to block attachment and replication. These also decrease inflammation. More studies from India. ECGC, curcumin, quercetin were found as active agents against COVID-19. ECGC from green tea was also far more active than the standard drugs remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine. Hmm. Did you guys see this on the front page news? I think I must have missed it. Anyways, now you are powerfully informed about this plant medicine. So molecular docking studies via computer are many steps away from actual proof in a human clinical trial. And trust me, there are trials going on right now for each of these, but the results aren't gonna be in until the end of this year or next year. And I don't wanna wait that long because the pandemic is now. Okay, so here's that list again. These are not comprehensive, by the way. I highlighted some of the vegetables that, that are particularly high bang for your buck. So the idea is just to eat a variety of vegetables, fruits, and herbs. These are medicine. Now, we all know that vitamin C is good for you. It's a strong antioxidant and it supports the immune system. There are many foods that actually have more, more vitamin C than citrus does. Um, I, I listed a few down there, guava, kiwi, bell pepper, parsley, kale, a lot of the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, which are really healthy for you in, in other ways. So these are all very high bang for your buck, okay? So there are multiple studies in intensive care unit patients and hospitalized COVID-19 patients showing that intravenous vitamin C may be helpful to decrease mortality. But one lesser known fact is that vitamin C is also a mast cell stabilizer. Mast cells are, are immune system cells that produce histamine inflammation. And histamine overload can contribute to many of the symptoms that we see in severe ICU cases. And vitamin C can reduce that effect. So it's helpful by multiple pathways. Furthermore, famotidine, you may have heard about this in the media lately. It's also known as Pepsid. It's marketed as an acid reducer for heartburn. Now we're starting to notice that patients on famotidine might do a little bit better in the intensive care unit. Now, I actually don't think that the benefit is from the fact that it decreases acid. A lot of people actually don't know that famotidine actually reduces histamine. It's also a histamine blocker. So in any case, this supports the vitamin C or benef uh, vitamin C benefit theory, and we'll be talking a lot more about vitamin C later. I'm a big fan. All right, how about other categories of food? So these have all been shown in previous research studies to just boost immune function in general, okay? So zinc, lots of data that it can decrease viral replication and is involved in the immune system. Oysters are the highest uh, bang for your buck. Eating three oysters a day will get you all the zinc you need. Um, smash fish. These are high in omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, so they help to decrease that baseline inflammation. They are also the building blocks for a group of signaling molecules called SPMs. 
special pro-resolving mediators, which are crucial for modulating our response to an infection. So try to get two servings a week. These particular fish listed here are particularly high bang for your buck and relatively low in mercury. Canned is just fine. Actually, a can of sardines has more protein and calcium than a cup of milk. All right, nuts and seeds, of course, from the Mediterranean diet studies, we know that these are anti-inflammatory, flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, almonds. These are also a vegetarian source of omega-3s and they also function as building blocks for those SPMs. Onions and garlic. So these contain a phytonutrient called allicin, which is anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. The enzymes that form allicin are activated when you crush or chop the onions and garlic. So let them sit for about 10 minutes before you cook. And you know, raw garlic will help with social distancing too. All right, mushrooms. So particularly shiitake and maitake mushrooms. These mushrooms have a type of fiber called beta-glucan, which activates our immune system. Always cook mushrooms, never eat them raw. Raw mushrooms can contain a type of toxin that are easily destroyed when you cook them, okay? Oatmeal and seaweed are also excellent sources of beta-glucan. Fermented veggies, such as sauerkrauts and kimchi, this supports the gut in its role in immunity. So again, you don't have to memorize all of these. If it's grown on a garden or a farm, or maybe came from the ocean, it's probably good for you. So I mentioned natural blood thinners here, mainly herbs and fruit that we've already talked about, because one component of COVID-19 illness is the blood clotting, strokes and clotting in the lungs uh, in ICU patients, and healthy eating can reduce that. So we've already seen a lot of this list already, and so there's just a lot of benefits to eating healthy. So this is just part of what I picked up at the farmer's market on Sunday. It's a pretty anti-COVID immune boosting selection. We've got some parsley, celery, cauliflower, onions, and garlic. Down in the lower right there, some maitake mushrooms. So Adam Wigmore said, the food you eat can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And I hope that you're seeing that today with this talk. So one of my best tips for getting your daily dose of this plant medicine, and it really is medicine, is with a morning smoothie. And it's especially great for folks who don't like their veggies. So just drink it down and move on with your day. But it actually tastes pretty great. So three cups of veggies, quantity matters, okay? So three cups, consider parsley and celery as a base and then diverse greens. And it's important to mix these up. I don't want you to have spinach every single day. Maybe throw in some radicho, some kale, some asparagus, some purple cabbage. A wedge of citrus with the peel. Remember the hesperidin is in the peel. You know, normally I'd have you drink three to four cups of green tea, but if you really don't like that, you can toss some green tea leaves for that EGCG. Some dark berries um, for antioxidant and some flavor. Now, frozen is fine. Actually, studies have shown that frozen fruits and vegetables contain just as many nutrients as fresh ones. So frozen's fine. Some rolled oats. Remember, this is for that beta-glucan. Maybe some ginger, onion, avocado. These are high in uh, nutrients and anti-inflammatory. I like the ginger in particular, adds a little bit of freshness to that smoothie. You wanna dilute a little bit with water. And you know, I'm gonna promote coconut water and kefir here, even though they do have sugar in them sometimes. So 98% of the US is deficient in potassium. And potassium deficiency is linked to stroke, diabetes, heart attack. So coconut water, kefir, and leafy greens are all great sources of potassium. And we see actually potassium, if it's low, increases mortality in COVID-19 patients. So, so lots of reasons to have some more potassium there. And then of course, a banana, um, uh, hemp seeds, hemp seeds for that zinc. Um, cinnamon can help decrease sugar spikes. Really important to know if you have diabetes and banana for that prebiotic and potassium. 
So this is your anti-COVID-19 smoothie prescription. Now I have some patients who make smoothie packs every week and just freeze them and then blend them daily for quick smoothies. Quick word on overnight fasting, also known as time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. It actually satisfies a lot of our goals. It decreases that NLRP3 inflammasome activation. We also know that it lowers blood pressure, sugar, weight, cancer risk, dementia. It's an anti-inflammatory. And um, when we fast, there's a particular ketone, an alternative fuel source formed called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And that's what seems to do most of the benefit here. So in addition to um, uh, all of what I said, yeah, it does increase, uh, decrease inflammation as well. So for starters, if it's difficult for you, just start with a 12-hour fast. And really, everyone should be doing this at a minimum, 12 hours. But the goal is really to get to 14 to 16 hours. That's when we start to see more ketone production. Okay, And um, really, ideally, we should stop eating about three hours before bed. So you can start decreasing your inflammation and improving your health just one overnight fast at a time, no matter what your baseline level of health is. Okay, so if everything I just said was too overwhelming, just remember, if it's from the garden or the farm, it's probably good for you. Now, I'm sure you're also taking note about what's not in any of these slides. There's no processed, packaged, fried, or sugary foods. So the thing is, I'm not saying that you can't ever have a piece of cake or burger and fries, but just be aware when you make this decision. You know, how do you feel after too many days of junk food? Maybe could you pick some fresh berries for your dessert? Or might you try adding avocado to that burger? So actually there's a research study showing that when you add avocado to your burger, you actually have decreased inflammatory cytokines found in your blood immediately after the meal. So there are ways to decrease your inflammation no matter what level of health or lifestyle you're starting from. It's your choice. Make it a conscious one, one meal at a time. Okay, emotional awareness. So what we think and how we feel drastically influences the performance of our immune system. You kind of know this intuitively that you're more likely to get sick when you're stressed out. So let's think about the top offenders, like the news. I like to say media distancing. So how do you feel after you watch the news? Do you feel empowered and vitalized and optimistic? If it's anything short of fantastic, you may want to rethink your choices. Or how do you feel after Netflix binging and Facebook binging? So again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do these things. I'm just saying have awareness about how you feel afterwards and then make a conscious decision for next time. So fear, stress, and anxiety can be perpetuated by our own negative thought patterns. I encourage you to be your own life coach and turn them around. Can I'm afraid of dying become it's time for me to be the healthiest possible version of myself. It's also important to know what your soul needs. So in my clinical practice, most of my patients admitted that the thing that they yearned for the most during this time was personal time, right? Overnight, you working parents became teachers, IT specialists, full-time cooks, babysitters. It's important to acknowledge your need for personal time, even if it's just a few minutes. So what would this look like for you? Maybe it's taking a quick bath, or just a quick walk around the block, or reading a few pages of a book. Take back the time for yourself. You deserve it, and it's medicine. Okay, this would not be an integrative talk without mentioning meditation. There are thousands of studies, but this is a summary slide of 20 review articles showing that consistent, regular meditation decreases inflammation, boosts the immune system, and as a bonus at the bottom there, it increases longevity by increases telomerase activity. So I've listed a few of my favorite meditation apps here. There's also an excellent class called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Class that is offered throughout Sutter Health and most major medical systems. But sometimes this feels a little bit like a too much, and I found like the best entry point to meditation is actually breath work. 
So you ever notice that when you're really stressed, you tend to hold your breath or breathe very shallowly? So I'm going to teach you a technique called the 478 breath for relaxation, which is something that was taught to me by Dr. Andrew Weil during my Integrative Medicine Fellowship. This 478 breath is based on an ancient yogic technique called pranayama, clearing of the physical and emotional blockages so your life energy can flow. Now this Practice will only take a couple minutes and it's kind of a nice break halfway through the talk. So I'm going to walk you through it with a demonstration and then we're going to do it together three more times. So the way you do it is you inhale through the nose for four counts, pause for seven counts and exhale through the mouth for eight counts. And it looks a little bit like this. Feels great. So let's do it together, okay? So assuming it's safe to do so, I'd like you to place your feet flat on the ground, relax shoulders on a straight spine. Let's just close your eyes. Let's get ready with an exhale. And when you're ready, take a nice big inhale through the nose. Two, three, four, pause. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and all the way out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more big one. Three, four, pause. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and slowly exhale all the way out. Four, five, six, seven, eight. And one last big one. Slowly exhale, breathe out any stress or worry or anxiety or fear all the way out. Ah, how do you feel? So if you feel a little dizzy, that's normal. We're not used to breathing fully since we're hold our, we hold our breaths when we're stressed out. That part gets better with practice. But hopefully you're also feeling a little bit of relaxation. What we know is that when the out breath is longer than the in-breath, we reset our fight or flight nervous system back to the rest, digest, and heal part of the nervous system. And that's good for our immune system. So I use this breath all the time. I invite you to do it as well. Maybe during a stressful meeting or when the kids are misbehaving or in line at the grocery store, you have a choice on when and how to bring yourself back into calmness, no matter what level of stress you're starting from. So breathing fully and calmly is your medicine. In the, re in the rush to return to normal, use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. David Hollis. Okay, next up is movement. So who doesn't know that exercise is good for you? So let's start out with a multiple choice question. Multiple choice. So moderate exercise, A, reduces stress heart disease, stroke, and dementia risk. B, improves blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol, metabolism, weight, bone health, mood. C, reduces NLRP3 inflammasome activity and inflammatory cytokines. Or D, all of the above. I hope you all said D. So NL NLRP3 inflammasome. So Drug companies are frantically looking for a drug that reduces NLRP3 inflammasome activity. What if exercise is that drug? Is it possible? We got another news flash here. Okay, of course it's possible. So let me show you this study that was just published last year showing the effects of moderate exercise. On the x-axis at the bottom, we see three groups. On the left is a control group, the couch potatoes. On the middle is the moderate intensity. And on the far right is the high intensity. On the y-axis on the side is the NLRP3 expression level. So we're going to look at that gray bar. Okay, The gray bar basically is the effect after 12 weeks. And so we're looking for a gray bar that goes down. Very good. At 12 weeks, drastic reduction in NLRP3 expression in the moderate exercise group. Now, those of you that are astute are noticing there's a bar that also goes way up. That's the high intensity. 
So we know that extreme exercise can actually be harmful. That's exercising at over 90% of maximal heart rate. So the goal really is just moderate exercise. That's 70% mo uh, maximal heart rate. This is kind of where you can, you can carry on a conversation, but you can't really sing, okay? You're building up a little light sweat, a little glisten, and the goal is at least 150 minutes per week. So you see, you have the built-in drug that all the drug companies are after. So no matter what level of health you're starting from, you just need to activate it. All right, so some of you might be thinking, I want to exercise, but I have no time, no energy, my knee hurts, my hip hurts. This is the time to harness your inner creativity and find what works. How about a 15 minute sunrise walk or a walking phone meeting, a little dance party with the dinner after kids or chair exercises, which you can find plenty on YouTube. So in fact, the Japanese have a practice called Shinrin-yoku. This is immersing yourself in a forest atmosphere, walking gently among the trees, smelling the nature, hearing the leaves rustling, feeling the wind against your skin. Even this very low intensity exercise has been shown to decrease blood levels of inflammatory cytokines in just two hours. So you really can improve your health no matter what level you're starting from. Be not afraid of growing slowly. Be afraid only of standing still. It's your choice to move your body. Make it a conscious one. Restoration. So everything that we just talked about is leading up to successful and restorative sleep. When we eat better, we sleep better. When we turn off the news, we sleep better. When we exercise, we sleep better. Everything is linked to everything, mind, body, spirit. So let's turn our attention to uh, a beautiful hormone called melatonin. This hormone is made by the pineal gland in the brain, and it helps to regulate our body's natural rhythm, that circadian rhythm. So what does melatonin have to do with the immune system? I'm so glad you asked. So. This is a graphic depiction of all the different ways melatonin influences cellular inflammation. So you'll see on the left that it, it's an antioxidant. It blocks oxidative stress. It blocks inflammation. On the right, it blocks activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, thereby blocking cytokines. It's actually really important for immune health. And pertaining to the COVID-19 infection, there's a theory that it may play a role in your body's ability to combat, to combat coronavirus specifically. So this is a graph of melatonin levels by age. You'll see it peaks in childhood and then slowly falls off after puberty. Now, I just told you that melatonin is an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant. So we lose some of our natural defenses as we get older. Now, take a look at this graph and then compare it to COVID-19 hospitalization age, it looks almost exactly the opposite. There's a much higher rate in the elderly, and we see very little children with hospitalization. So melatonin levels also increase in pregnancy, and pregnant women tend to be less susceptible to COVID-19 severity. So might melatonin be more protective from this infection than we know? So research is pending, but it seems reasonable for us to want to maximize this hormone. We can do so by greeting the early morning sun, also getting out a little bit at noon, letting the sun hit your eyes a little bit. The sunlight helps to set the circadian rhythm. Also caffeine. So in some people, depending on your genetics, caffeine in the morning can decrease evening melatonin production by up to 50%. So consider this when you're having trouble falling asleep. But by far the most significant influencer is gonna be blue light. Blue light is found in fluorescent lights, LED lights, and most electronics, TVs, tablets, and phones. So it's best to turn off electronics by 9 p.m. But if you really have to work beyond that, you can buy those blue light blocker glasses. And there's some apps that can help you to decrease and filter out blue light at night. It's your choice. Make it a conscious one.
Okay. So is there a role for supplements in supporting health and the immune system? Keep in mind that there is no combination of prescription drugs or supplements in the world that will do more for you in cultivating good health than what we just talked about. I've shown you the research. Food is medicine. Meditation is medicine. Movement is medicine. Sleep is medicine. Now that being said, I do think that rationally selected supplements can be helpful in supporting that foundation health. So here's my disclaimer page, okay? So there have been no proven human clinical trials demonstrating the prevention of COVID-19 infection with any prescription drug nor supplement. So it's important to know. There are many human clinical trials in progress, but those results will not be out until later this year or next year. So until then, we will use the science that we do have to make conscious choices. I recommend supplements that are third-party tested for safety and quality. That's how I choose supplements for myself. So I, sub I subscribe to a company called ConsumerLab.com, and you might want to do that as well. So this is a third-party uh, party. A uh, company that tests for quality to make sure pills have what they say they have. They test for safety, make sure there's no heavy metal contamination, and it provides a cost comparison. They also give you a lot of research summaries with the pros and the cons, all for the cost of one coffee per month. So I think it's a good company to support. And supplements that I've chosen to discuss today are considered generally safe for the average healthy population. But if you're on any medications or have any chronic conditions such as kidney or liver disease, you should speak to a practitioner who's knowledgeable about supplements to personalize your regimen. All right, so that being said, one at a time. This first section is more at targeting the immune system during the pandemic. Vitamin C, we've already talked about this powerful antioxidant, and clinically I've observed that patients who are already on vitamin C at the time of COVID diagnosis do way better. Studies are going on right now for intravenous vitamin C in hospitalized patients, but we're aiming to keep you out of the hospital by being proactive. So the main risk of too much vitamin C is kidney stones and loose stools, but this dose should be fine for most. Quercetin. So we talked about how it does very well in molecular docking studies, and there are currently studies in Canada and Turkey for prevention. But again, studies won't be out until next year. Also, quercetin, like vitamin C, is a powerful mast cell stabilizer, so it decreases histamine. So therefore, it's actually great for seasonal allergies. It also helps blood pressure. It's really hard to get high enough doses from food. So a supplement is helpful here. And the other thing about supplement uh, quercetin is that it does take a little while to kick in. So you might want to start it early. Melatonin, we went through the data, powerful immune hormone. And since there uh, seems to be an, an inverse relationship between your age and melatonin levels and your infection severity, something to think about, especially if you have a sleeping issue. There's currently a study in Bolivia right now using it nightly in healthcare workers as prevention. Uh, with or without insomnia, uh, but the results won't be out until next year. So a very low dose is all that you might need. Zinc acetate or gluconate lozenges twice a day. Uh, these are thought to decrease viral replication and the lozenge itself, sucking on the lozenge and having it coat your throat is very important. Um, don't take too much, 30 milligrams a day is the most I would recommend and, um, uh, and that dose is safe to take long term. It's important to take this at the first sign of symptoms, but you can do it as a preventive as well. So this next section is just for general health and immune boost. So if you're not drinking that power anti-COVID smoothie in the morning or getting your five to 10 servings of vegetables a day, um, a multivitamin is reasonable and get one with a good dose of vitamin A. Vitamin A is important for immune support. Vitamin D supports the immune system. And even in sunny California, most of us are deficient. Omega-3 from um, 
uh, fish oil. So if you're not eating two servings of fish a day, omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. And of note, high doses can also help with airway reactivity in asthma. So I do put my asthma patients on high dose fish oil. And then if you're not overwhelmed, um, I am a huge fan of turmeric, powerful anti-inflammatory. Consider adding this if you suffer from this uh, from arthritis as well. It works really great. And a probiotic. Um, probiotic, there is existing research showing that it can decrease viral infections and support the immune system. It's worth a try if you have any bowel issues and especially if you can't tolerate fermented foods. Wow, so this is just a tiny subset of the supplements that may be helpful for the immune system. But the point is not to have a meal of pills for the rest of your life. So these are the ones I think will give you the most bang for your buck. If you are pill averse or on a budget during the pandemic, stick with the vitamin C and spend the rest of your money on vegetables. If you're particularly high risk, Talk to your doctor about the safety of vitamin C, quercetin, melatonin, and zinc. Um, it may give you some extra immune boost based on the research we talked about. Um, so yeah, again, you have a choice on how to augment your health with supplements. Just make it a conscious one. So in closing, let me just share with you what I've seen on the front lines working at the respiratory clinics. Many people are testing positive with mild to moderate symptoms, and the ones that are doing the best tend to have lifestyles closer to what we discussed today. Not perfect, but closer, suggesting that you don't have to do all of it, just enough of it. And I ask every single patient about their supplement use, and the correlation I've noticed is that the ones who are already taking high-dose vitamin C just do better. So I'm a big fan of the vitamin C during the pandemic. It's a powerful antioxidant, supports immune function, and reduces histamines. But unfortunately, I've also needed to send some folks to the hospital, and they ended up on a ventilator. And it's the seemingly healthy folks that are unknowingly infecting those that are at the highest risk of dying. Remember, and I said this in the beginning, you can be contagious with the virus without having any symptoms. So please be a good citizen, wear your mask to protect others. What's very clear to me is that lifestyle matters. Okay, there's a huge difference between someone with heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes who eats vegetables and goes on a walk versus one who doesn't. The ones who are sedentary and eating processed foods are much more likely to end up in the hospital. So remember that no matter what your baseline level of health is, you can start making changes today to bring down inflammation levels. So here's your toolkit. And let's take a look at that couple in the corner and just imagine. Imagine this couple's having a good day. They wake up, maybe have a mug of green tea. They go for a sunrise hike. It sets their circadian rhythm, that sun in the morning. They practice Shinrin Yoku, going through the trees. They work up a light sweat with their hike, get some vitamin D from the sun. And perhaps at lunch, they make one of those immune boosting smoothies with a little protein on the side. They're relaxed. They have an increased sense of vitality. They enjoy a healthy dinner by seven o'clock, getting ready for that overnight fast. Perhaps they take a few mindful supplements and they choose to read a book instead of watching the news, electronics off by nine, optimizing those melatonin levels. And perhaps they practice some of those four, seven, eight breaths before bed. Mark Twain said, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. The secret of getting started is breaking your overwhelming tasks into small manageable ones and then starting with the first one. So as a takeaway from this talk, what's your first step? What first step will you make? It's your choice. Make it a conscious one. I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you for dealing with the technical difficulties. Thank yourself for choosing to be here today. I think we have a few minutes for questions and I got a bonus slide as well if the questions come up. So thanks again.
Thank you, Dr. Serioko. I will now begin reading questions from the Q&A box. So one of the top questions we receive that I can provide an answer to is um, attendees are wondering how they can get a copy of the slides and or the recorded webinar. And if this is you and you're interested in either one of those items, please email us directly at chrc at pamp.org and we can go ahead and send you either one of those items as you will see now on the slide deck. The email um, is there on the slide deck for you. And some questions for you, Dr. Serioko. Um, one question came in that had a, a bunch of likes from individuals. Does vitamin D boost one's immune system and how much do you recommend people take? So yeah, I pretty much recommend everyone to take vitamin D. I've been checking vitamin D levels on my patients for years, and there's a lot of research that suggests vitamin D levels of 40 or higher are the target in terms of decreasing dementia, decreasing cancer risk, and boosting the immune system. So I generally put my patients on a minimum of 2,000 units a day, um, commonly up to 5,000 units a day, eat it with a fatty meal. Everyone is going to absorb that differently. So the key thing is if you decide to take a higher dose of vitamin D, just make sure you check your blood level eight weeks later and then adjust accordingly. But I like a level of 40 or higher. Thank you. And another question that got a lot of likes from the attendees was, is decaf green tea as effective as caffeinated green tea? Yeah, that's a really good question. It it's it really does not have as much EGCG. Um, it has a lot of other good components in it, but since the decaf process does remove a lot of the EGCG, um, we do know that cold brewing green tea tends to extract the EGCG with less caffeine. So putting the tea leaves in, in cold water and letting it sit overnight is one way to get the EGCG with less caffeine. Great. And another important question that came in is, what would you do if you got actual COVID-19 symptoms? Yeah, I'm glad you guys asked this. I was hoping that because I actually made a slide because I get this question so much. The most important thing is definitely keep up with the lifestyle. Lots of rest, lots of vegetables, green tea, and coconut water for that potassium. Remember, the potassium is really important in a COVID-19 infection. But I pretty much just do what we talked about, but bump up the doses. So I, I wrote that slide for you. I personally would really bump up the vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams every six hours, or as much as I could tolerate. So remember, when the body's infected, there's a lot of oxidative stress, and vitamin C is very powerful antioxidant. Normally, if you take more than a thousand milligrams a day, most people will get some diarrhea. But during COVID-19 infection, your body needs so much antioxidant help that we're able to tolerate much higher doses. Um, and again, just be careful you have kidney stones. I would bump up the quercetin to every eight hours. And again, that's really only helpful if you start it ahead of time because it needs a, a ramp up time. Okay, so I take it twice a day normally, bump up to every eight hours, maybe increase the dose of melatonin because of that uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory and immune boosting activity. And um, definitely I would bump up the zinc lozenges, bump up the turmeric. And we didn't talk about it, but N-acetylcysteine, NAC, N-A-C, this is a very powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Um, it is also really helpful. There are existing studies that it's helpful in protecting the lungs. It also helps with the mucus. So I might add that on as well. Um, I think what I'd say about this is that the most important thing is to start these as soon as you get symptoms, like literally within the hour. So if you choose not to take any supplements, because you're feeling pretty good, which I think is fine. You might want to just buy a little care package, make a little care package of just in case supplements, because the last thing we want is for you to go to the store when you're sick. Don't contaminate the whole store. So you might want to make a little care package for you or your family or for someone who's particularly high risk. And at the first sign of fever or cough, start this high um, dose protocol if it's safe, if you have discussed it with your practitioner. Thank you. And another interesting question that came in is, do dehydrated fruits and vegetables have the same levels of vitamin C as real fruits and vegetables that have not been dehydrated? You know, that's a really good question. I actually have not seen studies on that, um, on dehydration. My sense is that it probably does retain the vitamin C because you can buy vitamin C in bulk powder as well. And the powder 
bulk may actually be cheaper than the capsule. So my guess is yes, but I actually haven't seen studies on that. Great. And, and one other interesting question was, do you recommend people to still take supplements if they feel they already have a healthy lifestyle? You know, that's a really good question because I like to be truly natural and truly natural means not taking supplements. But the reality is we are over farming our lands. Pesticides strip the soil of natural nutrients. And there have been multiple studies that have shown that if you compare broccoli today or an orange today to the same vegetable 70 years ago, there's about a 25% reduction in nutrients. And that's a study that's been done over and over. So the, the nutrients just aren't in the soil anymore. Now, if you buy organic, that does help quite a bit. But the other thing is our bodies also need nutrients to fight the stress that we're under and to fight environmental chemicals and toxins. So there are over 80,000 chemicals approved for use in the US. Our bodies need nutrients the, our liver needs those nutrients to bind those toxins that we're exposed to and get them out of our body. So I think a healthy lifestyle is important. I think that selective supplements may be an additional support. Thank you. So I'll go ahead now and ask the final question, which is, do you think that a vaccine will really fix this problem? Loaded one. Um, so I think that vaccines are helpful in general, but it's not going to be out for a while. It needs to be tested for safety, tested for efficacy. We have to find a way to vaccinate the whole globe. So my general thought on vaccines, I would say it's kind of like with supplements. I prefer to build my own inner resilience. It's a lifestyle choice. It's your choice, right? Um, and I use the supplements or vaccine to augment that foundational health. So vegetables, meditation, exercise, sleep, right? We saw the, 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 the research for all of that. Like if we put all of that in a bottle, it would be priceless. Lifestyle medicine is proven. It's effective. There are no side effects. So I would say your health is in your hands, you know, with or without a vaccine. It's your choice and make it a conscious one. Thank you, Dr. Serioko. And we want to thank everybody for joining today's webinar and handling the technical difficulties. We hope that you and your family continue to stay safe. And as always, please follow up with your care team directly if you have further questions. We will be working to get the recorded webinar of today's event posted on the PAMF Integrative Medicine webpage. If you would like to be notified when that becomes available, please email us directly at chrc at pamf.org. We also greatly appreciate your feedback on today's event. Um, the evaluation link is has been uploaded onto the Q&A box, so please feel free to go ahead and give us your feedback. And we want to thank you again for joining. Have a great rest of your day.